Good evening, everybody. Um, very warm welcome to this lovely uh, warm room at Kiel amidst a very cold environment and a warm welcome also to our online audience. I hope you're tucked up warm at home as well. It's pretty chilly tonight. Um, I'll introduce our, our speaker in, in a moment, but first I just wanted to introduce myself very briefly. Um, my name is, is Tim Lustig. I'm a professor of literary studies at, at Kiel. Uh, and I suppose you could call me the director designate of the Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences. In some way, it sounds better than director, doesn't it? Director designate, that's good. Um, so I start in the new year. Um, I'm really excited to be moving into this new role. Um, and I'm just sort of keen to do two things, really, two, um, two main things. And the first is to contribute to developing our cross-disciplinary uh, programmes at Kiel for current uh, and future cohorts of our students. Uh, and the second, which is in a way part of the reason that we're here tonight, perhaps the main reason, is to showcase to Kiel, but also uh, to a wider audience, the interdisciplinary research of academics, both from Kiel uh, and from beyond Kiel, and also to prompt cross-disciplinary thinking and talking and conversation about the uh, burning issues of our day. So hence the overall title of the lecture series, Grand Challenges. But let me now uh, introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Alice Eldridge. Uh, Alice is an interdisciplinary scholar uh, with a keen interest in how sound organizes systems. Her research integrates ideas and methods from music, computer science, ecology and anthropology to advance theory and methods in the emerging discipline of ecoacoustics, as well as to create ecosystemic music and experiential soundscapes. When we were talking earlier, Alice told me in her home institution at Sussex, she's moved between three distinct departments, which must be both interesting and in some ways a, a challenge. She holds a, P a BSc in psychology, an MSc in evolutionary and adaptive systems, and a PhD in computer science and artificial intelligence. She's currently a reader in Sonic Systems at the University of Sussex, where she's also co-director of the Sussex Humanities Lab, co-director of the Experimental Music Technology Lab, and a fellow of the Sussex Sustainability Research Programme. Uh, and Alex, uh, Alice will be happy to take some questions uh, at the end of the lecture. And for those of you who may be listening online, I'd encourage you to pose questions through the chat. Uh, my colleague David Ballantyne perhaps raised those in the Q&A se session at the end. So it's over to you, Alice, now for your lecture, uh, Soundscape Interfaces Toward a Transdisciplinary Ecoacoustics for People and Planet. Alice, thank you. Thank you very much, Tim, for that warm introduction, and to, to David also for the invitation, and Steve for his wonderful hospitality. So it really is a, a great honour and a pleasure to be here. Um, as, as Tim mentioned, I'm a kind of maybe hopeless interdisciplinarian. Um, and so it's, there's few places I feel really at home, but in an institute for both liberal arts and natural sciences, it is, is, is really feels, feels like a home from home to me. So to get a sense, can I just have a show of hands? Who's, who's liberal arts and who's natural sciences? Oh, so the arts win. Okay, so, but what I'm going to talk about this evening is, um, is, is, is very broad, <laughs> so it's going to be quite a ride, okay, so hold on tight, slow me down if, 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 we, if we move too fast. What I wanted to do is, is share with you some of the range of research projects that I've had the privilege of collaborating on over the last few years, including some current and future projects. And, and speculate on the value of this inter- and transdisciplinary soundscape research on addressing some of the grand challenges. So I'm going to skip over the technical details of things, um, but, if, but I'm happy to, to dive into some of those afterwards, um, if you like. So we face unprecedented challenges, that's no, that's no news. Climate change, biodiversity loss, poverty, injustice. The world is complex and uncertain and there are no simple solutions. So I'm definitely preaching to the converted in, in this room and to this audience to note that we need multi, cross, inter and transdisciplinary approaches to approach these many connected challenges. 
What I would like to suggest today is that as well as this broad disciplinary, disciplinary and maybe transdisciplinary perspectives, we can only affect the transformation necessary to ride out these crises by thinking also across levels of organisation, let's say. So we're going to be thinking from planetary scales right down to personal in the next 40 minutes um, and, and think how different forms of listening, quite radically different forms of listening, can begin to build some of these bridges. So as I said, I want to share, I'll share with you um, a range of collaborative projects, um, past, present and emerging, that illustrate, I hope, some of the ways in which these various forms of listening can both mitigate some of the consequences of our current crises and also potentially address some of the causes of these challenges. So this is a speculative and kind of new thesis, if you like. It's not something I've, I've, I've worked through. I'm using this space to kind of play with some ideas because I think that's also useful pedagogically for, for students to see people toying with ideas. It's, it's pretty radical, it's pretty out there, and it definitely crosses, crosses disciplines. But what I wanted to play with in this idea of soundscapes interfacing, right, is to think about the different, different levels, as I said, from, from ecological levels, how can we, we're going to think about this, the natural soundscape, the soundscape out in the world, um, and how that set of vibrations in the landscape is an interface, a literal interface between species, a communication interface between species and how we can use computational listening, so machine listening with algorithms, how we can use that as a kind of digital stethoscope to support nature and conservation practices. So that'll be the first section of the talk. Then I'm going to skip down to a more kind of cultural level and think about how, we, when we think about soundscape listening across cultures, when we listen in to what other people hear, we can, we can bridge otherwise kind of what we might say epistemological divides between we, we, we find a nexus where different ways of knowing can come together. And I think this is really important in addressing climate justice issues um, rather than perpetuating kind of imperialistic methods in, 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 in approaching these. And then finally, towards, towards the end of the talk, we'll drop right down into, into personal listening and, and dive below our normal conscious awareness using a, a, introducing the idea of microphenomenology, where the pioneer of this method suggests that actually when we listen to natural sounds in particular, so the, bir the bird song, the wind in the trees, we can, we can shift, we broaden our attention, and as we do so, we realise actually that these boundaries we normally construct between ourselves and the environment, between self and others, start to dissolve. And through this, we, can, we shift our value system and recognise that it's not us versus the world, it's not us versus the environment, right? That we are part of nature. So it's not a, it's not a people versus planet, we are the planet. In trying to save the planet, we're saving ourselves, if you like. So it's a grandiose, it's a grandiose um, gesture, if you like, but a kind of a story to frame some of these, some of these ideas. Okay. So let's start with, with, with the planetary scale problem of biodiversity loss. Uh, climate change is, is, is in the news, but in fact, um, if we, these may be familiar to you, these are the nine um, planetary boundaries, and at the top, the largest red sector is, is biosphere integrity. So... Data from many sources suggests that we are entering the sixth great extinction. It's horrifying, but, it, but we do need to face these facts. So the need for cost-effective methods for ecosystem monitoring have never been more urgent, both to support scientific understanding of climate adaptation, how our ecosystem is going to adapt as, as, as sea levels rise, as temperatures increase, and also, more positively, to, to evidence numerous global, um, European, national and local restoration programmes. So these are the, the, the symbols, some of these you will have heard of. We're, we're now in the UN decade of restoration, U, numerous of the sustainable, sustainable development goals um, aim to address and improve life on land. We have UK policies for biodiversity net gain. All of these are really, really positive interventions which are changing, as I say, local, regional, national and global policy. But these things can only work if we can measure them, right? We can start these projects, but in order to, to continue, in order to know what the intervention, whether the interventions we make are having, a, are having the requisite effect, we need to be able to measure. How do we do that? How do we monitor biodiversity at scale? How do we monitor biodiversity across the Amazon, even just across the campus of Kiel, right? It's a challenging problem. 
So traditionally, ecologists put on their boots and they went outside and they counted the trees and the birds and the bees and they tallied things and they did a bit of maths and they came up with a number, okay? And, and you can do that. Maybe we can do that in the garden surrounding this building, but you can't do that across the Great Barrier Reef. You can't do that across the Amazon. So with new technologies, we're, we're finding new methods to do conservation monitoring. The emerging science of ecoacoustics which is an emerging ecological science, points to the exciting possibility that we can eavesdrop on ecosystems, that we can listen in to ecosystems. So this picture of a stethoscope up here is to, to draw an analogy that just as doctors have listened to our hearts, our lungs, our intestines, we are learning to listen to ecosystem health. Okay, so if we think about this is a, the everyday experience when we step outside, we all noticed in lockdown, once there was less traffic, we suddenly became more attuned to the sounds of birds, right? We, we, were the birds singing more loudly or were we just listening more carefully? Um, there's, some, there's some science in that which we're not going to go into here. But the whole soundscape is made up of this, the, it, 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 all the actors in the environment, if you like. It's this high dynamic pattern of physical vibrations which emerges through biological, geophysical and technological processes. So bees buzzing, birds and bats calling, even fish whoop, wind howling, waves crashing, motors throbbing. It's literally an emergent symphony of life structured through these interactions of, of these organisms. We're familiar with this idea of bees and bats and birds and whales, etc., calling to each other. Um, and here's, a, here's a, a, a representation of the sort of anthrophony, the noise that humans make, the geophony, the, the noise of wind and rain, and the biophony, the, 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 the sounds of these other species. We're really familiar with these, with, you know, with birds and bats and bees and whales even. But contemporary research, and these first few examples are, are not our own, they're examples from other people's research, are showing us that actually an enormous range of organisms all across kingdoms, not just across the animal, but into the plant kingdom, are sensitive to sound and emit sound. So there's reefs showing that coral, the tiny, collop, the tiny polyps that make up coral reefs, actually use this crackle of the coral reef to navigate. They'll navigate according to that sound. We see these amazing mutualistic interactions as well, even across species. So we're familiar with bats using ultrasound to find prey, but there's actually incredible mutualistic co-evolution between bats and plants. So there's this, this is an example of a, of a carnivorous plant that's not very actually very good at, at trapping flies. So instead, it's evolved this amazing shape that allows the bat to easily find it. And it's just the right size for a bat to, to roost in, right? So the bat, the plant, offers the bat a lovely place to roost. In return, the bat poops at night and provides nutrients for the plant. So we have these amazing sonically mediated interactions between species. We see it even in the plant world. Plants actually emit ultrasound, ultrasound so high level frequency above human hearing when they're stressed. And, and this is hypothetical, but the idea is that then a neighbouring plant might realise that there's, there's drought. A moth flying past might adapt its behaviour in response to the plant's stress. Tentatively, in, in, as climate change progresses, a farmer might use this information to develop an irrigation plan. Not only do plants emit sound, but plants are also sensitive to sound. We think, we think that plants are beautiful colours to attract bees, but actually the very structure of petals also focuses the sound of bees. And as the buzz, as the pollinators that, that the plant needs to pollinate, right, fly past, the very buzzing sound increases the amount of nectar that, that plants produce, right? So we have these incre incredible um, sort of collaborations, if you like, these co-evolutions of intraspecific communication through sound, and not just within the animal kingdom, but across kingdoms. So what's this got to do with saving the planet? Well, if, we, if, if sound is central to the business of keeping alive, then if you think about your, back to GCSE biology, there's kind of an evolutionary pressure to be able to be heard, right? If you can't hear each other, you can't mate. Animals need to call to each other to, to mate, to, to protect their habitat, um, and so on and so forth. If you think of anyone playing with a CB radio, if you're on the same channel as someone else, right, you can't hear each other, there's interference. So what we're seeing here is a, it's called a spectrogram, and it's a visual representation of, of a soundscape. Um, let's see if we can hear it. Ooh. Yes, there we are. Oh, we've lost the sound. Never mind, we spent so long taking that up. Um, you can? Okay, perfect. So should I not put it there? 
Is that good? Yeah. That's good. Okay, brilliant. So what you're hearing is a mixture of frogs. The frogs are down the, frogs are down the bottom. You can hear some, some grasshoppers and katydids in the middle. Maybe just they go up above our hearing. For the older people in the room, your hearing might top out about 20 kilohertz. You won't hear the, you won't, and you won't hear the bats at the top, right? And what we notice is that there's this incredible banding, right? Different species seem to operate in different frequency bands. And we also see these kind of distinct patterns through time. So um, this, this guy, Bernie Krauss, was a keyboard player. He played the keyboard in the, in the, in the Moog. He, played, um, he played, played the Moog for the doors. Um, and then he became a bioacoustician. And from his experience of sitting for thousands of hours recording pristine habitats, he came up with this idea that at the time everyone thought the dawn chorus was a cacophony, right? All the species just calling off in at, random, at random. No, he said, there's, they're not, it's not a cacophony, it's a symphony. There's this very, very clear structure, this ordered, structured soundscape, right? So he went on to say, well, if this is the case, then we can listen, we can hear the kind of status of the habitat according to the structure of the soundscape. So very crudely put, in, a, in an ancient tropical forest where the species have coexisted for a long time, like well-rehearsed musicians, each will take their turn, right? There'll be this wonderful structuring. If we lose some habitat, if we chop down some trees, we'll lose some species, there'll be gaps in the soundscape. And if we have a regenerating, if we have an area of invasive species, a fast-changing habitat, a bit like drunk musicians who don't know each other, we'll have a messy soundscape where, 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 where creatures are, are talking over each other. Okay? So we see this, we're starting to build this idea of this, this soundscape as this enormous sort of space of semiosis, of signal and exchange and communication between species that also tells us something about the status of that ecosystem. And this is the science of ecoacoustics. This is what ecoacoustics is based on, this idea that we think about resource in terms of food and habitat, but actually sound is, in itself is a resource. And if it's, because it's a resource, there's competition. Through that competition, we, things are structured, and therefore it's a source of information about the status of that habitat. Okay, so these ideas actually aren't new. Back in the 60s, musicians like Hildegard Westerkamp wrote this explicitly. She said, musicians, musicians, ecologists use their skills to, 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 to look after ecosystems. Musicians, we can use our ears and we can hear this, right? But that wasn't enough <laughs> because, because ecologists and policymakers and people who have the budgets, they need evidence, they need quantitative evidence. And it's only recently that we've started to get the technology where we can apply these ideas um, in ways to build tools that we can use not only in, in our country, but also to build tools for people um, that, that empower those at the front line of, of climate change to support their own um, um, projects. So I'll, I'll do a very quick slideshow for those of you that aren't familiar with science to illustrate how we first kind of validated this approach. I was very lucky to cross paths about 10 years ago now with a brilliant conservation biologist called Mika Peck. And in, in around, yeah, around 10 years ago, we cooked up a plan to test this idea of a kind of digital stethoscope. Can we hear the sound of, can we hear the status of an ecosystem? Can we hear biodiversity? And can we measure it using a computer? Okay, so when, 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 you're trying to, when you're trying to prove something scientifically, you have to show a difference, right? And, and unlike, um, we, we, we can't wait around for like 100 years for an ecosystem to change. So what we do instead is we go out into the world and we find ecosystems at different stages, yeah? So, so here we've got a, a representation of um, the, the sort of scientific method where you've got red is a, less, is a more degraded habitat. So this is agricultural, monocult monocultural land. So a barley farm in the UK and a palm oil plantation in Ecuador. Then we've got regenerating land, land which has been rewilding, if you like, for some time. And then we have some ancient kind of pristine habitats, okay? So that's our kind of basic scientific setup. Now, this is a, this is a, a really interesting mixture of, of, of very muddy field work. It involves going out to forests around the world, strapping recorders to trees, and then collecting loads of data, and then coming back and doing equally muddy multivariate statistics to try and make sense of all that data. So to give you a quick idea, what happens is we record... These recorders record digital audio, just like your phone does. And the, and the, and the, the, the description at the top is, is 24 hours and showing you that we can program these recorders to record around the clock. So we take like maybe one minute every 15, we record the whole dawn and dusk choruses. 
So we make an acoustic sampling protocol so we can record the dawn choruses and through the day and through the night in all these places. And this is, I'll just give you a really quick slide so, so you can imagine the, the, the research process. So this is the southeast of England, um, and there's three sites there. There's a, the, at each site, we, have, we put out 15 of these recorders, so that's about a kilometre by half a kilometre to give you an idea of the scale. And this is literally climbing up trees, and <laughs> climbing a tree and strapping it into a tree. Okay? So you can see visually we have some ancient woodland, we have a, 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 a farm that has been rewilding, that's, that stopped being farmed and just let na nature's taking its course. And we have a barley farm. Similarly in Ecuador, this is on the west coast of, of Ecuador in the Choco region. Um, we have a slightly different transport system there. We have um, some, some, some pristine rainforest. We have some regenerating land. And we have an oil palm plantation. So similar, similar setup. Um, and, and what we can, we can, we can hear these... Um, can you hear? Can you hear that? Yeah. So in the UK, we can we can actually hear these differences in the UK, and you can maybe visually see the patterns as well. You can see in the woodland, um, you can actually hear the resonance of the reverberation of the trees, and we can see there's very, fairly sparse um, calls, but they're quite well structured. If we move into the regenerating farmland where we have a mix of farm and woodland, we have loads more species because we've got this mix of two habitats. And they're really quite noisy, talking over each other. It reminds us that the dawn cause is very much a fight. <laughs> and then as we move into the, the, the farmland, it's pretty much silent. There's not many species there. Maybe a few skylarks, a few corn buntings, because there's nowhere to live. If we move to Ecuador, it's a bit noisier. So there's a whole bunch of other different species making noises, frogs and insects, as, as well as the birds. So to answer our question, can we hear biodiversity, we need to, we need to compare our new digital stethoscope with a, with a traditional method of counting the birds. So what we did was, was we recorded tens of thousands of these files over several weeks in each of these habitats and then we got some amazing ornithologists to listen to about 1,500 files each and label every single species that they could hear, right? And then we did the same thing with all the, with all the audio files we had. We used some machine listening. We did, basically did some maths on that audio to describe those files with a number. So, and then, we, then we're looking for patterns. Do we see the same patterns in the species, the change in the species, as we see in the change in the numbers? And, and actually... Um, it's easiest to see in these, these just sort of descriptive, descriptive plots. What these show you, that each different dot is a different one-minute file. And we see the red ones are all over on one side. That's, that's the primary forest. The green ones are the secondary. And the blue ones are, are, are the palm oil. And we see specific species. There's only howler monkeys in the forest, for example. If we look at the audio, we see a similar pattern. The blue is separated, and we see the red and the green are sort of mixed together. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to dive into these results quickly because there's quite mostly an arts audience here, but just to give this, this impression that we can get this, this separation, the same patterns we see in the species. So again, in the UK, the, um, the field is much more distinct to the, the woodland and the farm and mixed woodland. And we see this same kind of pattern in, in the um, acoustic data. We can also look th through the day and see these kind of patterns through, so we can see the silent nights in the UK and these, the dawn chorus kicking off. In Ecuador, we have the reverse pattern where we have a lot of silence in the day. And I'm sorry, I didn't realise the room would be big relative to the slide scale, so these are probably too small for you to see. Oh, you've got there as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and, and here we have the reverse pattern where we have quite a lot of silence. I don't know if any of you have been to the tropics and these amazing frogs and insects kicking off in a kind of dusk chorus. So this gave us the, the, the reassurance that we can get this a, a kind of, um, the, the, the normal patterns that we can hear with our ears, we're seeing in our, in our algorithmic ears, if you like, in our digital stethoscope. So that, that was really encouraging. And then another piece, another piece um, so if you're not data scientists, these, this will look more like a, a, a checkers board to you. Um, but what we can also compare is, if we use the lists of species to try and understand which habitat we're in, we can compare how well we can do that with a species, which is the traditional way, with how well we can do that with our acoustic method, which is our new, our new method. And, and the, the important thing to note is, the, is how, how white, the not, how black the diagonal is, and how white the not diagonal is. <laughs> and just to interpret this for, for, for people who aren't data scientists, what this is showing us is that 
in the UK, and even more so in Ecuador, is that the soundscape is actually telling us more about the, the nature of the habitat than the list of the species is. Right? We don't know exactly what, because it might be, for example, NEP is under the aircraft, is, under, is near Gatwick, it's under the Gatwick flight path. It might be that just there's an aeroplane going over. But it's a really encouraging and exciting result to say, OK, there's definitely something in the soundscape, which we all know, right? which artists have been saying for decades, um, there's something in the soundscape which is telling us about the status of the ecosystem. OK? So all that approach has been done with taking a one-minute file and sort of a bit like making a mosaic, saying, what's the overall colour of it? What's the overall sort of texture or, or, or audio in that file? But I'm a musician. <laughs> I grew up playing the cello in, in chamber orchestras, in, in orchestras. So this, for me, this idea of, of a symphony and this idea of like this dynamic interaction between voices is, is what is core to the soundscape. And, and I've studied ab sort of abstract computation ecology, if you like, as well as thinking about dynamical systems. That's how thing things flow. Sound is dynamic in space and time. Organisms call in space and time. So it seems wrong-headed to me to chop up these files into little one-minute segments and then try to make a decision based on that. We can definitely get some information, but maybe there's something else to be learned by looking in different ways and by measuring in different ways. So... Yeah, being in sort of inherently uh, having a brain that works across disciplines and having grown up um, alongside some neuroscientists, I thought, actually, it's not a dissimilar problem to the, neuro the ones that neuroscientists who are concerned with, can we measure consciousness, right? I'm not saying forests are conscious, but it's a similar problem. How do we go from this physical reality of the brain to this kind of emergent pattern that creates consciousness? And there's some really exciting advances that are being done by putting as you see on the left, these kind of brain EEG caps on the brain, what that gives you is a series of what's called time series data, yeah, just a bunch of numbers. Um, and what we're finding is that even measuring the patterns in those numbers, just, just, just one sensor at a time, can tell us quite, quite clearly whether that person's um, been anaesthetised, whether, whether they're asleep, whether they're awake, whether, they, whether they're coming round from anaesthetic, right? And we can also look at the kind of communication between those points and say, well, to what degree does a point here predict what's happening over here? I.e., how much kind of information is flowing around the brain? So what we're starting to do now with a team and, and, and the mathematics of it, I, 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 I'm only just beginning to understand, but I'm working with a brilliant, brilliant team to try and apply some of those ideas to say, can we look at the way, instead of, in, can we measure the way a, a forest, the kind of health of a forest, by measuring to the degree to which the information's flowing through the forest. So basically how well the creatures are communicating with each other, right, to come back to this idea of, of information flow. So to come, this is, to come back to our, our forest, these are all the recorders in the forest, and what we're looking at then, we, we might produce, this is very early results and these aren't definite yet, but what we can see is the degree to which we might be getting information flowing between the soundscapes, okay? So that's the deepest maths bit we're going to go. We're going to pull back out of maths for any, any non-scientists now. So we, we, we kind of drawn this idea, and, this is, and, and, and Helen, who's here, is also working in this exciting new field of eco-acoustics. There's lots of people all over the world working in this now. We've drawn together this idea of the global soundscape as this sort of semiotic, meaning a source of information, a set of signals which organisms use to live, to live by, literally, right? And we've said that computational listening, so machine listening, what often gets called artificial intelligence now, we can use as a kind of digital stethoscope to reveal patterns in those data and, and then support nature conservation and, and preservation. Okay, so I grew up in the countryside and I, and I love academia and I love science and I love uh, numbers, but I'm also sort of sceptical of it. And I'm also, part of me thinks, well, if this guy Bernie Krauss thought that you could listen to the health of an ecosystem, it makes sense in evolutionary terms. We're seeing these patterns in big data, but there was something that sat right. For, for me, I, I felt, well, if that's true, right, if you can hear the health of an ecosystem, then surely people who live in noisy biological ecosystems will we'll think that too, right? And, and we might, we want, we, so we might ask a forester in, in the UK, but what about those communities, forest societies, who have continuously lived in forests and live 
for generations and generations and generations and rely on the forest for their health, their culture, every aspect, would we not see some of, some of these ideas of you know, a healthy forest having a good symphony? Would we not see that in their practices, in their, in their cultures, in their songs, and so on and so forth, and in their stories? The first work we did in the, in the Amazon with the Warani communities, we started asking some kind of naive <laughs> uh, sort of ethnographic questions, and we didn't really get anywhere. And, I, and for some years, I was thinking, well, it, doesn't, it just doesn't sit right with me. I want, I, want, I, want this, I want these kind of ways of knowing to all collide, if you like. I want to see this in everyday practices. And then a few years later, I was lucky enough to work with Mika again, um, out in the reef, in, in, on a reef monitoring project in Bali, in, in Indonesia. And I was helping him to pilot some acoustic methods that we could use to support a community reef restoration project. So as I'm sure you all know, Indonesia is an island-based nation. Um, they rely on, their f on fish for their food and their economy. Um, but there's also a huge um, problems with cyanide and dynamite fishing, which people use to, as, a, as a method of fishing, um, which is destroying the reefs. There's also lots and lots of community restoration projects um, which are working. Visually, you can see, oh yeah, there's more fish. But again, they need evidence in order to get the funding. Um, and the government protocols are too complicated. There's not enough people with the skills to run those protocols, to collect the data, to get the, to get the evidence. So, so Mika's idea was that if we could make tools, affordable tools, literally using a GoPro to take some video, to record some audio, could we then, could we then validate a protocol that these communities could themselves use to keep their projects funded? So the crackling sound that you can hear might be familiar to anyone who's been snorkeling. It's the sound of snapping shrimp that live in the reefs, right? And there'd been already research showing that this sound of this, the sound of these shrimp um, is an indicator of the reef, right? The, the reef, and you all know, a, a healthy reef system makes a kind of complex environment that lots of organisms like to live in. So the reef crackle, and then that brings in fish. And fish actually make amazing kind of whooping and farting and grunting noises as well. So the idea is then, right, that you, can, that you can listen to the reef, you can do these digital recordings, you can do some similar maths, and maybe you can use that as a way to evidence um, the, the, the monitoring protocol. And then the fisherman who needs to go out and do cyanide fishing to get his, to get his, get his finding Nemo was terrible for the reefs, to go and collect their little Nemo and got $10 for that but destroyed the reef, maybe he could be paid $10 a day for collecting that data instead. Right, so we start to build together sustainable livelihoods along with affordable monitoring tools. So the science is, of that is quite positive. I'm going, to, I'm going to skip over that quite quickly, but just we, we have a similar protocol. You go to a, state, a number of sites with a different um, ecological status, healthy reefs, degraded reefs, interim reefs. You measure the, the fish abundance by counting them on a video. And then, you, and then you measure the audio, and, you, and we did some amazing 3D photogrammetry stuff as well. Even if you're not a scientist, the, the, the plots on the right, you'll see there's a, a positive relationship between the amount of coral and the amount of fish, and a positive relationship between um, some measure of the sound and the amount of fish as well. So that's exciting, but that's not what I want to focus on here. What I was interested, actually, was, was a conversation I had one day when it was too wet to do any work. And it was with an amazing conservation biologist who was a, was a, a, a local um, Indonesian. And, and I asked him, well, what do you think? You know, we've got this grand idea that we can, that we can use sound to monitor biodiversity. But, but I didn't want to impose my ideas on him, you know, on those communities. I wanted, that, I wanted, it, I wanted to make technology that, that aligns with their ways of doing things, right? Because then it makes more sense and can be more readily adopted. So I said to him, what do you think? Do you think we can listen to a reef or is that a stupid idea? And he looked at me as if I was an idiot. And he said, yeah, of course we can. When we go night fishing, we get the oar from our boat, a wooden oar, and we just put it in the water and we listen for the sound of raining. And when we hear the crackle, that's where the reef is and that's where we fish. Right? So that felt really positive to me because then it meant that we've got this relationship between, between ecological theory, evolutionary theory, and kind of big data but also a traditional practice, a traditional ecological knowledge, a traditional way of doing things. And that feels like a really positive way for me, to, to my mind, to tackle some of the um, ecological problems of the world in a way that addresses some of the issues of climate justice, in a way that, 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 that kind of brings kind of an equity, and, and more importantly, a certainty that we're on the right path. 
when we have these distinct ways of knowing or epistemologies for, in academic terms when, they, when those come together. So I'm just going to say a few more, few more things about that because in, in, in lockdown, so what I'm saying there is that the, the soundscape is this kind of every day, you know, a kind of universal space of communication, right? Not just for species, but in cultures and different, and different ways of knowing. And, and in, during lockdown, I had a chance to, to explore this further remotely through with, by supporting a, a PhD student who had worked on the original um, eco-acoustics project. She was back in Ecuador. Ecuador was locked down like everywhere else, but they had no um, support. They had no financial support at all. Um, and she was working with indigenous communities. People were very uh, afraid of the elders catching COVID and, and those, you know, all that knowledge disappearing. Um, and at the same time, those communities are really under threat of, of oil and oil um, and gold and so on and so forth, mining concessions. And the only way really to, to conserve those species and protect for those um, communities to protect their territories is to get some kind of recognition of the official status of their, of their territories. Um, and this, this, these particular communities um, live in the, in the eastern, eastern Ecuador, in the, in the Amazon, and there was a set of communities that already recognised, they had this term sachitaki, which means songs of the forest. And these communities already were saying, actually, what's important to us is the soundscape. Because the soundscape of the forest, the forest singing to us, that is the centre of our, of, our, of our ecology, right, of the ecology, but also of our culture. Because the whole idea between nature and culture in these communities is meaningless. They're forest societies, they're shamanic societies. So they had identified that this was quite a canny way, working with a charity, that this was a sensible way to kind of articulate why the importance of their territories, both culturally and, and ecologically. But they needed help to kind of articulate that in a way that, you know, they could fill out a form and do bureaucracy, if you like. So we had a wonderful project with, a, with, a, with an amazing team of, mixed team of people using mobile walking methods, so very participatory research, literally walking with hunters in the forest. What do you hear and what does it mean? Sitting with women in the field, what do you hear and what does it mean? And then sitting around in the community at night and talking through those interviews and, and what's important and kind of surfacing different ideas. And rather than writing that up as an academic paper, um, there was an incredibly talented illustrator who made these, which are printed, you know, four meters square for the communities. These kind of sound maps, which which articulate um, these really, really important relationships, not only with the, the the animals of the forest, but with the weather, with the forest spirits, with their ancestors. And, I, and I'll share the links to this afterwards. All these are available online. They made a beautiful documentary as well with interviews from these communities. So, um, oh, sorry. I'll just read out in case you can't see this a direct, a direct quote from one, from one of the communities saying why, why the soundscape is so important to them. So they say, we use the songs to communicate with the jungle and its guardian spirits, to call the animals of the forest or the fish of the river, to invoke or promote the fertility of crops, to cure evils and disease, remembering and transmitting the teachers left by our ancestors. So they need these to live well together, which is the basis of Sumac Alpa, their, their, their kind of foundational cosmovision, if you like, which is that a good life is not about being, having money and having lots of cars and having fancy clothes. A good life only exists when every, when every being is well, when every being lives in harmony. Okay? So they say that the importance of the soundscape is like roads and bridges, they reconnect with our history and with our origins. The living beings of the jungle also have their own way of expressing life that manifests through them. So the set of songs we hear, the soundscape, is like a symphony which took millions of years to write. It's a unique and priceless creation which we cannot let disappear or be destroyed. So in this, we see then the soundscape here is an interface not just for the, the actual creatures, the toucan and the monkey that we can hear, but between the, the humans, the animals, as well as the weather, their ancestors, their spirits. And these shamanic societies blur the kind of waking and sleeping night, uh, aspects of their life. And they blur nature, culture, history and future, if you like, too. So this really sums it up for me, this, this, this one... This one um, 
Quote, for us, the Kitswa Kaushak, such an ancestral people, these, these seven communities, the forest is a being of which we are part, and communication with these beings is the fundamental to achieving Sumak Alpa, as I say, literally a land without evil, meaning a harmony between all beings. So for me, this was like a really extraordinary insight, because I'd been thinking, Where's, where are these stories? And suddenly, like, wow, like this, this rich um, cosmovision essentially kind of articulated through what soundscape means to them. And I think this is important for, for conservation imperatives because, it, because it, firstly, it makes us reflect on our own relationship with the natural world, right? These same communities will say, I'm not defending the forest, I am the forest defending itself. Yeah, there's, there's, there's not this division either between culture and nature or between themselves and the rest of the forest. So it dissolves these boundaries and, and, and it makes us realise that very, very literally, we can't, there's no point in thinking about ecological conservation versus cultural heritage, right? We can't, they're, they're not separate things. And I would argue it's the same here in the UK, we've just forgotten, right? That we can't separate really our culture from our nature. If we dig back just a few generations, it's not so different, okay? So for the last few minutes, I'm going to dive even deeper, and it might, artists get this, so actually you're mostly artists, so maybe this won't be radical at all. But this idea then that, that, that the, the, the Kausak Satra communities see no separation between, them, but between themselves and, and, and nature, for some people, as I say, it's, it's normal. I grew up in, the, in, the, in Her rural Herefordshire, and sheep farmers, I don't know, are very much more tuned to the land there than a lot of my colleagues who, who grew up in urban places. Um, but this, so this, this, this listening in, listening to what other people experience, then I think is a really valuable way to understanding this kind of, the connection that people have with environment. But coming back to the science of consciousness, we actually know that what we experience and what we're conscious of experiencing is a bit of a lie. So there's a bit of a theatre going on, right? We're not actually, we kind of construct these stories in our heads to make sense of what our bodies are feeling, what senses are, are, are coming in. And, 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 and based on our kind of expectations and shaped by our life history. So this final step, I want to do a deep dive from ecosystems <laughs> through these kind of communities down to ourselves, down to our own personal lived experience and go below our everyday uh, kind of conscious awareness of experience into what Claire petit Mongeau, who I'll introduce in a sec, calls the felt dimension of experience. And I'll go, I'll go straight in with a quotation that she kindly wrote on a piece of paper for me on a, on a course, on a training course I was with her, with, uh, on with her last year. Um, she said, and she's French, so she's very poetic. She's a neuroscientist and a microphenomenologist, which I'll tell you in a sec. She said, natural sounds, meaning the bird, sounds of birds, are a privileged mean, means to become aware of the felt dimension of experience where the separations between inner and outer space, between mind and body, and between sensorial modalities vanish. Okay, so what does she mean? She's, she's, a, she's a cognitive scientist, a neuroscientist, and a proponent of what's called microphenomenology. Her research focuses on these unrecognised microdynamics of the, what she calls the lived experience. She's particularly interested in where do thoughts come from? We have a thought, where did it come from? What was happening before we were aware of that thought? How, how can we explore that, right? It, within, within neuroscience, it, she's a scientist. What does she mean by this, this, so this, so this idea of the felt dimension of, of experience is, is, is this idea that below our conscious level, below our kind of verbal exploration, we, have, we actually have an experience that's pre-emotional, that's deep down in our body, that's felt, okay? And this, this, there's a method called microphenomenology. It's just a, it's an interview technique, and then an analysis method, much like any other qualitative analysis method, um, to, to help us dive in to these moments. And it's almost like magic, I can say. You, you dive in, and you dive into very specific moments, and you start to reveal these experiences that, that the person wasn't aware of before, right? So she's interested in how do we study... This, this comes out of neuroscience, so for, say Francesca Varela, who was a, a very famous neuroscientist and not unincidentally also a Tibetan Buddhist. Um, he, he, in, back in the 90s, he said, well, neuroscientists, neuroscience is trying to understand the brain, consciousness, experience, but we do it by measuring electrical activity in the brain, right? That's ridiculous. How can we study the inner processes of emotion, decision-making, reading, ideas, creativity, by relying on objective recordings of brain activity, 
right? And, and, not, and not listening into what the subject is experiencing. So this process of microphenomenology then is, a, is, as I say, an interview method um, where you guide someone back through their, their, back underneath their kind of verbal experience of, of, of the world. And what, uh, um, what Claire says then is this, is this is something that you can discover through that method, or also just through kind of dissolving your, softening your attention, if you like. So she says, so, and, this, and, and I, I shared this with some, some colleagues on a, on a field recording course in Scotland, and they all just, well, anyway, I'll, I'll say it to you first and see what you think. So she said, suppose, for example, that, you, that on a walk in the countryside, a bend in the path reveals a new landscape, okay? Immediately you recognise its elements. There's a birch tree, there's a stream, and you can say, oh, yeah, it's over there, okay? I locate it at a distance from myself, and I'm here, and it's over there. But there's another way of looking at this. There's a, there's, a, there's a way of looking with a less tense, less focused attention, where, where, where I recognise the contrast of light and shadow and leaves, of shades of green and pink and reflections in the water. In this sense, the landscape kind of comes to me, and any writers or painters might be familiar with that mode of, of, of looking. This landscape kind of comes to me, and I'm touched by it. So instead of looking at objects over there, I let the colours and the shapes and the movements and the sounds come to me. I let the atmosphere, the particular rhythms that emanate from the landscape permeate me, a little like perfume or music. And the landscape is no longer an expanse that presents itself to me as a spectacle, like, much like a photograph. It's no longer looked at, but it's felt. And this feeling dissolves the boundaries between it and me. And certainly... For me, that made sense. When she, talks, when she talks, for example, the song of the bird is not over there in the throat of the bird, and it's not in me either. It's somewhere in the space between, right? Somewhere in the space between where the world and I meet. And what she's saying is that when we, when we loosen the tensions that cut us off from our own inner experience... We don't find a mind that's separate from a body, separate from its environment. These words are just abstractions. They're just constructions. They're concepts that veil the reality of what we live. And there's very many different ways. We come back to this. There's different ways of arriving at that same point. I don't know if any of you have read David George Haskell's um, Song of the Trees. This is purely from a biologist, right? Life is a network. There's no nature or environment that's separate and apart from humans. We're part of the community of life composed of relationships with others. So human nature duality that lives near the heart of many philosophies is, from a biological perspective, completely illusionary. So we've had a crazy whirlwind. <laughs> we've, we, we've gone from, from the planetary scale, through ecosystems, through cultures, down to very, very personal experiences. And what I've tried to um, make the case for is that various forms of listening can both mitigate some of the consequences and address some of the causes of, these, of, of the ecological and other challenges that we, that we face. Learning to listen to biodiversity can sensitise us and help us understand more about the lives of others. It can help us to create technical tools to monitor, protect and restore ecosystems. Learning to listen to what others can hear can ensure our tools and our policies meet the needs of those at the front, line, at the front of climate change and can encourage their voices and values to be included in data collection and policy making. And then through our own personal listening, we can get in touch with the felt dimensions of experience where these constructed boundaries between self and other, between inner and outer, disappear. So altogether, these technologies, methods and practices provide us some tools, I think, to, to have a degree of positivity in, the, in these difficult times, to tackle contemporary ecological crises, and, and just maybe to start to shift the values through, and through that transform the causes, reminding us that we're, we are nature, <laughs> that we're not protecting the planet instead of ourselves, we're protecting ourselves in, at, at the same time as we're protecting the planet. So, a crazy, grandiose thesis, but... Yeah, maybe something to, 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 spark, your, to spark your thinking. I, I, I just want, I have finished, but I want to acknowledge that this is by no means my work. All of these projects are a huge team of people. I won't name them all individually here, but it's really important. So this was the, the people we worked out in Ecuador with, um, and in the UK collecting the data. There's a huge team in Ecuador for the Satchitaki project, and a brilliant, brilliant team I'm currently working with at, at Sussex with, between neuroscience and, and ecology. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'll take any questions.
Thank you so much, Alice. That was really, really inspiring and, and so kind of wide-ranging, you know, from the from the pantry to the personal. The sound, that idea of sounds, a, a, an interface point for the whole uh, network of, of life, a kind of boundary dissolver. And I was going to say that you know those slides at the end confirmed it. It was great to hear about your research, but also about you know the brilliant colleagues that you've worked with as well. So. I was just happy to take questions from, from the audience, and we, we might have some questions from our online audience as well. Thank you. Hmm. Uh, I know, I'm just, uh, we have got some microphones ready, mics as well. Okay. We have. Uh, could you bring the, the There's a question at the front. Is it on? Yes, yes it is. Yeah. Um, I originally uh, intended asking questions towards the end about my particular interests, which lie in uh, protection of plants, um, and particularly plants that uh, have problems with insects. Uh, I was interested from the point of view of plants attracting insects and was what would, would like to look at the possibility of plants repelling insects or possibly drawing insects away from plants. However, the thing I would really like to say was right at the end, um, with with the the, the personal uh, relationship that I have uh, with sound in the world, that, those those points that you made that really brought that home. You probably can't see from there, but I I, I wear hearing aids. Um, I'm of an advanced age, and some of the stuff that was putting through, I simply couldn't hear. I. I kind of denied this for, for, for many years. No, no, the family, as far as I'm concerned, they'd say to me, you know, you, you're not hearing me. Oh, I can hear you perfectly well. There, there is the occasion where it can be convenient and not, not, not necessarily to hear. But when I eventually was persuaded to go and, uh, and have my ears tested and have uh, the hearing aids that I've got, when they first, I've given them, I put them in, uh, I switched them on and I moved and the world had come back to me. Mm. I could hear the leather creaking in the chair I was in. Um, I just burst into tears. Mm. It, it, it is so important to have, to, have this, to have this relationship, to have the differences that, 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 you, can, that you can hear uh, in the sounds of, of, of music, for instance. I think you said you play the cello. You can produce a note, an A on the cello, and they're not quite the same because of the the the, the, the resonance, the, the added bits on top. So that was really having come around all those points. The question I wanted to ask you was about the recordings that, that you make, those little one-minute sound pieces, files that you have. How broad an analysis do you do on that? Do you do on them? Do you look at simply the the, the pitch? Uh, how much? Uh, how many? Um, uh, the, the side peaks and things are that, that there are in it. That's yeah, so there's question. there's like dozens of different. There's been there've been dozens of different ways of um, proposed of, of analysing those. Um, sometimes, yeah, looking at simple things like spectral centroid. What's the sort of average pitch? Even even just looking at the overall RMS, so the overall energy of a file. Some of the ones which which seem to predict quite well the spe the range of species is. Um, I don't know if you're a mathematician, you basically take the spectrogram, look at this range of energies, and you do an entropy, Shannon entropy. So you look at the evenness of the acoustics. Um, and, and if you bung, not surprisingly, if you bung a load of them together, you get a better description. I think of it like, you know, the blind man and the elephant, when one's saying, I've got the trunk, and it's, yeah, it's like a snake, and another one's got the tail, and it's like a piece of string, and the other one's got the arse, and it's like a wall, right? That, that any one measure is never going to tell you much, but if you do, if you do lots, right? Then you, then you build, begin to build up a picture. So that's that's what's been happening the last last sort of decade. Now we can use um, various deep learning models, so AI models, to kind of automatically learn a description, which might be like 128 different numbers which describe it. But we don't know what those mean particularly. But what we're trying to do with the with the neuroscience inspired stuff, even before we get to the dynamic stuff, which gets the statistics are beyond me. Um, is even just say over the dawn chorus, let's say, over that two that two and a half hours, say of a spring dawn chorus, what's the we can look at things like um, Lempel-Ziv complexity. So what's the kind of range of patterns that are in there? 
um, or, and what's the ordering of those patterns? So we start to look at this, essentially like the shape of a melody line. You could do the same maths on, on a Beethoven sonata, right? What's the, what's the, and and you, you can, you can look at the mutual information between notes and you can see this is Beethoven, this is Mozart, this is Shostakovich. So it's, it's using those kind of ideas. Um, and there's a, there's a rich um, possibilities of different sorts of mathematics which haven't been explored yet, particularly looking at yeah, these temporal patterns that I'm quite interested in now. One, one quick addition. Having, uh, having said that, uh, as, as, the, as the soundscape, perhaps in the field, changes, it will be changing for the season, will be changing throughout the day. So you, you, you have that range of, 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 of knowledge. Yeah, and, and, and for those people, that it's not my prim primary research interest, but for those people concerned in, in climate adaptation, that's an amazing indicator, right? When do spe You can start to see when, does, when species migration changes, are there, are there shifts in the dawn course according to the temperature, these kind of things. So, so zooming right back out to, to look at um, changes over the years, these diurnal and, and phenological patterns are, are really when crucial. In particular, bird or insects, the sound it is making at any one time may be for various reasons. And you can then identify that further down the line as to what, uh, what condition uh, that animal or insect is responding to. Can, could you therefore then subsequently regenerate those sounds uh, either from recordings you've made or artificially to influence those, those yes, organisms? Yes, that's a pretty standard method in ecology. People do that, even, you know, even to me measure bats. You do playback for, for, for timid bats to lure them out. It's a bit cruel, really. Pretend that there's some. Yeah, you, you can you can play a bat bat, bat sound back to yeah. a bat. And, yeah. I think we should, I think we we we've only got a few minutes left. So thank you. The, um, how you, uh, the process of sort of uh, on the ground researchers and people from you know, global north and global south, as far as like how you decide to go to say Indonesia and Ecuador, uh, what's that sort of process like? So both those sites, are, I was very much a kind of um, led, if you like, or a part of a research team led by the colleague Mika Peck. Um, he's worked out in, in Ecuador for about 30 years now. He's a conservation biologist, but he's, his raison d'etre, if you like, his whole process is always based around um, sustain, integrating sustainable livelihoods with conservation, right? Any, any of these kind of front, like, like forest societies, you have this conflict, and, and a conflict between SDGs as well, right? Between, between good standards of living and, and high conservation value. And th this is part of the problem with this kind of 30% set aside, right? Is you then create these kind of fortress conservation models, as they're described, where, where you're not allowed to hunt. But then <laughs> how do people eat, right? So, he, so his whole approach is to, is to set up projects where, where as, uh, the, the conservation goes hand in hand with, with, a, with livelihood. So, for example, in, in Ecuador, that he's set up in a, a big reserve now, which is where the last remaining brown-headed spider monkeys live, where the communities, that, that land is privately owned. Previously, people would earn money from logging. It's also an amazing cacao-growing culture, but people didn't know how to process the cacao. So through an opt-in process, if, the, if, the, if each individual family opts in, they get um, training in how to um, process the cacao and they get a better price at market for the cacao as long as they keep X percentage of that forest standing. So there's no pressure to be involved, but there's an incentive to be involved. And that's the what's one of the only reserves in Ecuador that's not armed, that's not protected, because the whole community's bought in. Right? So his whole thing as well, he's, he's, set up a, he's a big proponent of um, what he calls para, parabiologists, so again, those local guys, often guys, but also increasingly women in that particular reserve, again, who used to go and get their $10 from hiring a chainsaw and chopping down trees, they then get trained in, in basic conservation skills. Um, and he's now actually set up an organisation, a company, to support specifically support those communities in Ecuador with collecting the data they need for, to make the legal case for rights of nature, which has been part of the constitution. 
So it's always this very, very embedded. Um, in so if you wanted to be super critical, you could say, well, you're still imposing kind of imperialistic science methods on these communities, but the projects are always community-led. It's always a community-led project that needs support in, in finding tools to evidence what they're doing, rather than an imposition, if you like, of, a, of an outside. So I don't know if that answers your question. Bringing a couple of colleagues from our, our music department, and, and initially Fiora, I think you know us. Fiora. I would have, because my voice is out. <laughs> Thank you. He's on, right? Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, for your talk. Really. Um, my my. Okay. To contextualize the question, I'm an ethnomusicologist, and I'm from Peru. Yeah. So um, what I was thinking when you were talking is it resonated a lot with, well, Stephen Fell's work and, and the concept of anthropology of sound and, uh, well, acoustemology, right? Acoustemology, yeah. Exactly. And, and I, was, I was thinking in communities, of course, that, that are more connected with nature. So your examples of Ecuador, for example, in Peru too, and in other parts of the world, this connection with nature is common knowledge, really. Um, they wouldn't see it as disconnected as you just presented. Yeah. But in my opinion, and this is a big <coughs> question really, but how do we approach authorities of these same countries in Peru, for example, and Ecuador, that are not necessarily connected with nature because they are, don't belong to these communities, and people also not from countries like the UK, for example, that you can say maybe, or you will, I will dare say that they are not that connected to the environment as people in, in Peru or Ecuador, for example, are. Um, how to, to, sh to teach them in a way how to hear or how to listen to these? Because, I mean, all these theories in music, right? You, you are not only a musician if you make music. You are also a musician if you listen to music, because if you don't decodify it, yeah. then there's, no, there's nonsensical, right? So how to really be, go beyond this research and really make people that should be listening to this and learning how to listen to the environment appreciate these communities and appreciate all the work? And, and my question was a little bit twofold in a way, very quickly this. There is a gender dimension that you didn't touch upon, and I'm very, very, I'm, I'm very excited to see a woman doing this kind of research that has to do with sound studies, it has to do with that, because it's usually a realm that, <laughs> that is, is seen, at least, as very masculine. As it is also the stories that are told somewhere else about sound and what do they hear. In some places, women don't listen to the same things that men do. So is there any aspect of gender in, in, in your research too, or maybe not, of course, but thank you very much, and sorry that I really... <laughs> thank you, no, lovely questions. Are we okay to carry on? Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for the question. So I'll go the, in reverse order. So the, the gender, I don't know. I was quite a tomboy. I kind of grew up, I felt, I, I felt ungendered when I was a kid and it kind of dismays me slightly, the gender wars, at the same time as being a woman and, and recognising that, you know, we need to, to have equality. So I have a, a bit of an inattention with that. Um, certainly the work that we've done in, in other communities where there's very, very strong gender differences and, and for example, that, that work in, in Ecuador was very, you know, d d down to needing to have different um, workshops. Sometimes you would, you would need to have just the women together in order for them to speak. They wouldn't, you know, partake. And, yeah, and they would have very, very different um, reflections. We, even, even the walking methodology, which was itself designed together, then the women would be like, no, well, we, this, we spend our time in the chakra, this is, this is where we want to talk to you because we want to tell you about this, what this sound means. When I hear this frog, it's be, because, because I need to plant the corn now, right? But the hunters are like, oh no, we, the men will be the hunters and they will be in the forest and they'd say, well, no, when I, we need to go in the forest because that's where I can tell you what happens when I hear the sound of this boar and we need to climb a tree because <laughs> they're going to be chasing us, you know? Um, so in that very, very, very simple, simplistic sense, yes, I mean, th th those were differences. The, the research team actually, so I, this was during lockdown, right? So I wasn't even in Ecuador. This was, this was a, a um, um, uh, Ecuadorian, but not indigenous um, colleagues working two, two women and a, and a filmmaker was a man. So the illustrator and the lead, and the, and the lead um, researcher were both women. Um, 
it's not they don't explicitly like bring in feminist theory into that i think that of course i think there are gendered dimensions i think a lot of these ideas kind of resonate with with you know theories of ecofeminism and stuff i think but 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 my but my feeling is that they also resonate really strongly with yeah with buddhist thinking with 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 an awful lot of indigenous thinking with an awful lot of with, with systems thinking, with cybernetics, you know, where you're often men, actually having exactly the same conversations and having this, exactly the same ideas. So, I don't know. I, 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 what I struggle with with, with, gender, with gendering things is that then you get this sense of otherness, which I think is, 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 is not constructive. And that actually, in all of these debates, and this is, I probably shouldn't say this because it's broadcast and recorded, but sometimes I feel like there's, you know, there's been a very much um, a move of all, almost, I don't know, there's been a lot of enthusiasm and interest in like indigenous cultures recently, right? And, and again, it's, there's a tendency to sort of, other, it's like almost like othering. But, but actually, if you look across the world and across time, it's actually imperialism, which is the other, right? Everyone else actually, throughout time and space actually had really similar ideas and then we had this horrific bubble where a lot of white men have had quite different ideas if i if i'll say it i mean i haven't i wouldn't normally say that out loud but like so i think it's quite interesting to think about norms and what do we think what, we sit here and say that's other but actually isn't if you look from there then isn't that the other if that if that makes sense so i don't know if that answers your question at all <laughs> i probably should think it more think it more through more, more clearly and carefully before speaking out loud very good question Vera. thank you very much and uh, we've gone slightly over our time but i, I see Vera, you have a question yeah. i have a quick question yeah. uh, I was, uh, thank you very much for the uh, lecture i really enjoyed it um there's a history of uh quantitative research for raising awareness about the environment, uh, sounds, uh, picture, soundscapes. You mentioned the uh, Francisco Varela's um, 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 name, or together with his uh, guru, uh, uh, Umberto Maturana, they developed the, the theory known, uh, known as Santiago theory and autopoiesis. Also, if we move to uh, Lynn Margulis' theory of uh, Gaia and so on and so on. So they've been around for more than half, more than half of a century. And why would we be optimistic in hoping that the quantitative research is going to get to the corporate world who run everything around us? How are you going to, what kind of language are you going to, used to represent the qualitative research, and hopefully that may, that works this time. Thank you. So just to check the question, how, how are we going to use quantitative data to convince the corporate world of, of, of Gaia and of symbiosis? Um, well, one, one thing, if we're positive, and this is an important thing, I think, for this emerging fields of conservation technology, and it's really, really important to keep these things kind of open, open source and, and free and to keep this work, because that's becoming big business, right? In the next five and ten years, biodiversity monitoring is, is going to be a massive industry, because already every building, every new building in the UK, you know, Tesco, every corporation has to evidence, has to evidence this. So... If I'm really positive, <laughs> if we do all that well, which I'm not, I'm a bit sceptical of, then, then, the, then, the, then people might start to see the data themselves as changing. Talking to people, I, yeah, talking to people who work in big, big, big business, in corporations, there's already this big, a big, big shift in, in, in moving from just return, um, like it's state, you know, capital return, to social and, and ecological um, so we start. We are starting to see that shift already, and and if we think about systems thinking, if we get that shift enough, might we might we reach a kind of tipping point where where corporations actually recognise, even if they don't get the intrinsic value, right? They might have an there'll be a financial requirement to an intrinsic value of biodiversity, and that's what I cling on to. That that will be a, a kind of a flip where every every business has to have it built in, and that and that financial. Um, return isn't isn't the driver of everything, and then and then extractivism isn't what's driving things, and then you flip around to conservation. That's the positive dream. <laughs> Thank you very much for that question, uh, Miro. And do you have a quick question? Yes, thank you. Mm, Dr. Ellis, I really enjoyed your lecture. <laughs> mm, 
I've only been in the UK um, for two weeks. Um, <laughs> and this is um, the first academic uh, lecture I have ever um, attended. Um, which happens to be the subject I, I'm interested in, the community of life the community of life, um, which you talked about at the end. Um, I really like uh, your research method too. Um, what I'm studying is the learning community in the new university. Um, um, your research has inspired me a lot, especially the comments on dualism. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I think that's a, a vote of thanks. I don't know whether you want to respond to that first. I'd just to say thank you. Excellent. Okay, I think we've come to the end of our event this evening, so uh, let's begin to wrap things up. So thanks uh, to Alice for a, a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Also thanks to our uh, AVS team at the back there, and, and thanks to Steve uh, Kilner and, and to David, who's been looking at... Uh, online questions. So our next event is on the 8th of February 2023. Book it into your diaries now. Um, we are welcoming, thank you, um, we're welcoming uh, Malik al uh, to give a lecture which is brought to you by ILAS but in conjunction with the Race Equality Lecture Series. Malik's uh, lecture is titled Lifting the Barriers to Black Academia Through Positive Action and Decolonization. It's another of our hybrid events it will start here on the 8th of February uh, at 6 p.m., but it will also be available to uh, an audience online. Uh, all details of how to register are on the IMS website. So thank you all for coming, and I hope to see you next time. <laughs>